right, fall color winter enters class time. Thanks for coming down. Who's who's uh, new to classes here? A few guys, welcome. So it's always a fun one. The sun's out today, which is not usually uh, early October. Nice and warm. We can all get home and work in the yard when we get done, right? So we'll kind of talk um, about fall color, about a few things in to show you. Uh, lots of pictures as well as some winter interest. You know, I've been doing this uh, with 32 years and one of the most common questions I always get is how can I make my yard look good all year round? So this would be the class where we show you some plants the season you're not thinking about the yard quite as much, especially things that uh, kind of bloom over the winter. We often get some fragrance, um, but a lot of cool fall foliage and then a lot of evergreens that, that uh, we can have some, some fun in the winter with as well. Um, being in Washington, and I wouldn't trade it for anything, we have a lot of green or the evergreen state, right? So I always say rediscover your evergreen state in your yard and add some yellow, some blue, some different colors uh, that really do pop in the wintertime, especially when we're just kind of just down to gray skies usually and uh, nothing but green everywhere we look. So so we'll show you a few. Have you, uh, everybody's got a copy of the handout? It'll give you kind of way too many plants on the list like usual to kind of consider for uh, adding oh, to the garden a little here. bit. Okay. Um, that's always one. We do record this. Don't worry, none of you are on the recording. Not to worry about it, but uh, we try to keep the curse words to a minimum because they'll hear all that, right? So, so we'll try to keep our mind, our mind, our P's and Q's. So I'll show you a few here, you know, kind of before we start looking at plants, you know, kind of. There's a class coming up here in just a couple weeks that I do specifically on conifers. So we'll talk a lot about dwarf conifers, big conifers, small conifers, everything in between. I won't spend a lot of time on those today, but again, if you look at evergreens versus conifers, a lot of blues, a lot of yellows, different textures, different growth habits. You know, to me, those are the backbones of the garden in the winter time. You know, we can add some really fun conifers in uh, for both the color and the texture. Uh, broadleafed evergreen shrubs and uh, you know think rhododendron that's an easy example of a broadleafed evergreen but we probably all have enough rhododendrons in our yard I'll speak for me I do so what do I add that would be interesting on top of that a lot of variegation different foliage colors things that turn color in the winter you'll be surprised with a few things that are green all through the growing season and then we start to get cold in the fall and they take on different colors for the winter but don't drop their leaves so that's another option Lots of fragrance, believe it or not. You know, that's one, especially when we get towards the tail end of winter, there's quite a bit of choice of good, easy plants, Northwest staples that we can use that offer quite a bit of good, good fragrance as well to the garden. I know we're not outside as much, obviously, in the winter, but I think particularly when we add these things, maybe to some pots, areas by the porch that we come in and out of the house and things, you're really going to enjoy the smell a little bit as well. Um, you know, for me, I go bold a lot. I love foliage, you know, flowers kind of come and go, um, but we're always left with the leaves. So I'm always looking to go bold with variegated things, uh, bright yellow foliage, gold foliage. It may not be for everybody. I know some gardeners see a yellow foliage plant and think it needs fertilizer. So that's kind of up to your own personal taste. Uh, but I think again, with the greens that we have as a background around here, a lot of those gold foliages and variegation really does pop in the landscape. Um, same thing in a couple weeks, that last one there, we'll be doing evergreen perennials. Used to just do kind of hellebores, which we will talk a lot about those as well, that class. But also mentioning other perennials that are evergreen and offer again fall, winter interest through the dormant months. So uh, that's a class here in just a couple weeks as well. <coughs> um, deciduous shrubs, trees with bark color, interesting branching. You know, I love lace leaf maples as an example, and I don't care that it's bare in the winter because I think it has a beautiful structure and a silhouette in the garden, you know, popped up against with other plants. But it also could be, you know, white bark birch tree, a coral bark maple, paper bark maple. There's a lot of fun trees or plants that offer us peely bark, different colored uh, stems in the wintertime that again are gonna add interest during that dormant time. Um, we're going to look at some fall color. I mean, this is prime time here this year uh, for fall color. I will say this, a common question we usually get is, why do I drive out Highway 2 and see the brightest oranges and reds? And I never see those in my yard. Does anyone kind of feel on that? Because I can all hear that a bunch this fall. You probably water too much, to be honest. Mother Nature is always going to keep things tidy. I was pretty surprised with the drought we've had this year. It has been really dry since April, essentially. And, 
usually it's what summer starts after the 4th of July right around here so we've got a couple extra months of sun which is awesome but I figured the native stuff might get a little tired here in August and go more brown yellow but I we drove out too and it's looking spectacular like always so um, that's all a lot of times the answer to your question why does my yard turn yellow and brown and I don't get all the bright colors you're probably watering a little bit too much especially late in the summer I shut off my watering when I got back from hiking late August and I haven't done much pots yes dry areas underneath eaves yes I'm not saying I don't water at all but the main landscape that's established you got to start to let it harden off and turn all those beautiful colors that we get to enjoy here for fall if I watered every day my sprinkler system and all that I probably would have more of the yellow brown like I see around a little bit too okay um, I'm always looking uh, to keep my hummingbirds happy I'm not a huge you know hang me a sugar feeder every five square feet and let them go to battle all winter although we do do sugar feeders um, I'm looking for some plants that will keep them happy in the winter you know hummingbirds do need some nectar but a lot of times in the winter it's a little bit more protein side so bugs debris things that we leave in our garden will help as well but there's also a few plants uh, that will keep them happy again especially as we get into the December January February time frame there's quite a few plants uh, that would help um, keep those hummingbirds happy as well um, we just had bulb class a couple weeks ago but again we would have some options um, for really early bulbs I mean I can go in there in my own yard and I could look out the window starting about Christmas maybe the first second week of January and I'm gonna see bulbs starting to bloom I've got from winter aconites to crocus early daffodils species tulips there's a lot of stuff high sense that we can put in that are going to give us really good color and a lot of times some good fragrance in that January February time frame too which, which still would be in winter as well but of course we look for flower power wherever we can I, nothing's better than coming home and seeing something blooming in after the holidays right when everything else is just done um, there is the one flower I'll just tell you we get into January we can do some primroses everybody knows those but right you now for the fall here I've already taken home a couple dozen pansies I'll probably take a couple dozen more home as I continue to revamp my planters and boxes and things that's the one flower that could shrivel up and freeze like an ice cube and then three days later it thaws and you're like I can't believe that's still alive so uh, the pansies will keep going all winter long uh, as long as we again make sure they're not dried out so underneath eaves and things but I don't care how cold we get the pansies are going to thrive uh, through our cold winter months okay so if you look at just a few kind of examples to give you a little taste you know here's a little conifer class preview we'll look at about 50 of these things in the conifer class but I can find things again bright yellow like that chief joseph pine that's a particular pine that would look green as green all through the year and then we get to this time of year and it turns bright gold almost orange gold for the winter months and then springs back to green again so that's a perfect example to me of a winter interest plant something that's just going to glow in the winter silvers like the korean furs icebreaker that's a little miniature creature taller upright ones we can do too but that's going to give me almost that flocked christmas tree look you know curled needles with a lot of the silver the blues the greens going as well you know arborvitae people hear that that word arborvitae they think are little green soldiers for blocking the neighbors off there's a lot of fun arborvitaes we don't have to do green we can do gold ones ones that turn a little orange in the winter this is a great little dwarf round one called fire chief uh, that really has got good color all year but especially in the winter we turn turn towards that rusty orange uh, color which oftentimes is a good one to pop in the landscape um, and I love Japanese cedars I think I brought one up in the front and the bottom there but that to me a lot of these would turn color you know I'll get some bronze some purple maybe some different tones yellows on those anyway but to me that's just a fun texture plant you know we don't see we have a lot of firs we got a lot of cedar we got a lot of hemlock we got certain conifers around here but that looks totally different almost ropey foliage um, and we can get tall trees miniature ones everywhere in between uh, some really fun little plants if we look at some maybe some broadleaf stuff so you know why why the heck do you put blueberries on there you know we don't have to have northern high bush blueberries that's a spectacular fall color shrub I get to eat it so I'm never going to talk you out of planting some regular northern high bush blueberries like we would find at the blueberry farm 
but a lot of the evergreen ones I think more and more people are using more southern high bush where plenty warm enough to have these live through the winter it's never a temperature thing but a lot of these would actually keep their leaves in the winter and turn some color we look at bountiful blue pink icing there's quite a few new newer blueberries the last decade or so that are sh shrubbier and shorter look like nice shrubs in the yard you might not even think blueberry when you see them um, but i would hold my leaves and turn some bright colors over the winter without just going dormant and then having twigs until next spring again uh gravelia i go back and forth every year whether i should put this one on there um, Grevilleas A are not very easy to find. I don't know if any of you, anybody got Grevillea in there in their yard? Um, I've had it a couple times over the years and then we get a cold winter and I have to go find another one. So that's the other hesitation with Grevillea right on the hardy line. I see plenty of them around. I live in Everett. I see plenty of them in yards here and there and they're healthy as can be. But finding the right spot that's maybe sheltered in the winter. A lot of times Grevillea blooms in the cold. So some of these will go December to February other ones repeat a little bit um, it's the perfect hummingbird shrub if you can get one thriving but they would like hot they would like dry and a little bit of room to grow most of these are pretty pretty bushy shrubs so if you want to try something fun you think you might have a sheltered yard that would be one to kind of look around for because that is a pre pretty fun little plant um, I took that picture of, uh, it specifically because you can see the thorns right now barberries always have thorns uh, which usually says to some gardeners, I don't want that, but they serve their purpose. It's a fun one. I'll, I have two teenage, almost teenage sons, and I'll have those underneath their bedroom window so they can't get <laughs> But uh, But uh, Barberry is kind of a fun one because um, the thorns aren't the end of the world to me. I mean, that's a great shrub. It's evergreen. Typically, these type of barberries are going to turn purple or burgundy in the winter and then just sit there with that color and then go back to green come springtime. These pictures would be like right at the end of winter. I can get Darwin's and get an orange flower or go Warty Barberry and get almost a gold flower. But those are really heavy bloomers. I think super important for the early pollinators. That's always a great one for the bees early in the season. Uh, they bloom profusely, just covered in flowers. Um, and it's right there at that tail end of winter. So we get into like mid-February-ish to that March time frame, that's always going to give us some really early nice spring color as well. So don't hate Barberry because it has some thorns. We can put on some body armor before we got to ever prune them. Um, but it's certainly, I, th I think, a worthwhile shrub to try. We don't, we sell a few of these a year. I wish we sold more because I think that's a, that's a good plant up here. Uh, there's a couple of really good fall bloomers. Now both these would be hummingbird magnets. Um, Camellia Sasanqua, I brought just a little Yuletide up here if you like your red Christmas blooming one. But we can do uh, Sasanqua or, or, um, or Fall Camellia in whites, pinks, reds, doubles, singles, some different colors up there. We have full selection right now. Uh, would be a good time to get them. This is not a plant you'll find at a lot of nurseries in the summer. We typically sell out and can't get them again until the fall every year. So there's some great choices up there right now. If I had Park Shade, like some winter bloom these a lot of times will start like november others in december but i will get flowering off and on through the winter months which again not a lot is going to bloom um that time of year for us in our garden so that would be a great choice for a nice big evergreen shrub uh, that would give us a little bit of flower power in the winter on the other side there are strawberry trees so that's arbutus we're kind of a relative of our native madrone but strawberry tree blooms in the fall, so it would be in full bloom right now, and we're getting those fruits on there this time of year. They're not strawberries that we eat, like regular strawberries, uh, but they do kind of look like them. But I would have evergreen, fall flower, that fruit hanging on the winter is exquisite, and these have that cool kind of peely cinnamon bark, reddish bark, like we would see on our native madrones as well. So uh, be careful with that one. I've only carried dwarf strawberry tree, um, you know, for years, probably 30 years now. It's only been dwarf strawberry tree, and dwarf in the strawberry tree world means about 12 feet by 12 feet. So we can prune it to keep it smaller, but that's a big specimen shrub. That's not a little tiny thing that we would tuck in our garden. So that would be certainly a, a specimen choice. If we look at some foliage stuff, you know, just as an example, like Mexican orange. Anybody got Sundance Mexican orange? 
So that blooms, it's got great fragrance in like May, June, but in the winter time, I would have the leaves, I would have that bright gold or lime colored foliage is nice and interesting, a little nice color to contrast with some of the native greens we have around here. Or we have lots of mandinas. You know, they call those heavenly bamboo. They have nothing to do with real bamboo. They're not invasive. They don't run like bamboo does, but it kind of has that foliage look to it on a little dwarf shrub. So lots of choices on those these days where I can get burgundy, I can get red, I can get kind of coppery colors. We can get all kinds of different foliage colors on those and have a really nice little three, maybe four foot evergreen shrub that loves sun and is super drought tolerant. So that might be one to, one to think about as well. Now a couple kind of common things we see around here, azalea and rhododendron. You know, and I'll speak for me, when I chose the rhododendrons and azaleas to put in my yard, winter is a consideration. It's, you know, I think they all got nice flowers, they're all gonna bloom in the spring. You know, that's never an issue with rhodes and azaleas. But what do I got the rest of the year? I mean, let's be honest, if we think rhodes and azalea, what do I have, a month? maybe six weeks, I got some flower power on there and then it just sits there and I will see you again next spring kind of thing. So I'm always looking for a second season. There's a lot of good azaleas like Johanna, uh, Gerard's fuchsia, we got cherry drops. I got all kinds of fun azaleas out there still that have really nice flowers in spring, but when we get to the fall, the whole plant turns burgundy or red for the winter time. So again, not just another green shrub that we can have in our yard, but something that's got some nice foliage color. So maybe if you're thinking about a new azalea, consider make that as an additional consideration. You know, what, what do I want for winter time? Just more green or do I want a little bit of foliage color? They're not gonna lose their leaves, but I have that color to enjoy all winter. I brought one up, there's one in here somewhere. I can see the azalea right in the front right over there. You can already see the burgundy red, the whole plants turn color for the winter time. That'll be back to green next March again, so then it'll still bloom. So that's, that's a fun little azalea. Same with PJM, I brought one in here that's already turning its colors for fall. You know, this is one that I'll lose the old leaves in the middle. I'll get oranges and yellows and reds and different tones going, um, but I'll keep the tip foliage and then that will turn that mahogany, you know, kind of purplish color for the winter, which again, to me, adds more interest. Then my little flower buds are out in March and I start to bloom right the tail end of winter. That's a pretty easy uh, early bloomer for a rhododendron. So just again, another, another thing to think about as you're choosing. The other one, I think I left it down front, is variegation rhododendron. You know, <clears throat> you know, we do ponticum. I would have a big leaf with white and green striping on it, or we keep a few President Roosevelt's around. That would give me the gold splash, variegated uh, rhododendron foliage, both nice flowers again but I've got that added additional interest of having the foliage on there as well, okay? Uh, Daphne odora, now that's our winter Daphne. So the only things that are gonna kill Daphne is bad drainage. We're not gonna turn the rain off here in the winter. It can rain all winter long, but if I have clay or bad drainage to walk away from the Daphne, I've had to do it in a few areas of my own yard. It just needs to be a little higher and drier. It doesn't matter that it rains all winter again, but the water's gotta dissipate through the soil and not sit there underneath it or we'll get root rot pretty fast. So Daphne is a great one for part shade. You can see beautiful variegated leaves. And then I would get to February and I would have those fragrant flowers open up to kind of welcome me towards the end of winter and early spring. So really nice, I think a really nice shrub for an entry garden or a part shade garden, kitchen window kind of thing where it might open the window for some fresh air you know, February, March, and you got some fragrance coming in. That's a really, really heavy sm smell plant. Um, there's Mygema, there's Banana Split, there's Lightning. I got, there's a bunch of really good Daphnes around these days. Um, basically, they keep selecting them for heavier variegation, more yellow in the foliage. You can also just get green. If you're not a yellow foliage gardener, uh, we can find green on that as well, and just all the same flower, okay? The other side there's a stillium. Anyone had the stillium yet? Anybody know that plant? We got a new one. We got a new one for you. We've been carrying it quite a few years now. I saw it years ago, uh, kind of coming out of Canada. We never really used it much down in the states. Um, it's kind of a southeast plant, but it's a. I, it, the easiest way to explain it is everyone know witch hazel. You know we have witch hazel in our yard. Blooms in the winter. You got the little spidery flowers. I think we have one of those coming up. This is evergreen witch hazel. 
So this is in that same plant family that would keep its leaves, have colorful foliage, evergreen, but I would get out there in December, January, and I would have red spidery witch hazel flowers all along the wood in the wintertime. Mm. Um, that is a, you know, to me, a pretty bulletproof shrub. We try to sell a lot of people these instead of laurel. Um, I think it would make a great hedge. You can clip it, you can use it as a filler plant, but it's a fun little shrub if you want something a little different. Again, that would bloom in the winter and stay evergreen. So yeah, this this is a this one you can see a little bit of purple on is one called Cinnamon Girl, but we get a few other ones out there just green again or maybe with some red on them. You can do do some different choices on those. Now I think English holly should have been banned out of this state probably a hundred years ago, but I, we don't usually sell English holly here. That's the stuff taken over the native woods um, with all of our big Christmas berries on them. So we try to, we, you know, we get some fun hollies in that are so fertile or foliage type hollies. If we look at osmanthus, what they would call holly leaf osmanthus, that'll look just like holly. I got a little one in here somewhere. You probably see it better than me. It's on the corner, of, yeah, down the front there. That, <coughs> that would have the look and the texture of holly without the berries. That doesn't get a bunch of red berries that the birds are gonna eat and drop me presents all over my yard in the next year so I have hollies everywhere. So that would be all about foliage. Great color in the winter, great color all year long with something variegated like that. On the other side, I've always liked the scallywag holly. That's got a good name, scallywag, like a pirate holly. But that's a little dwarf male one. So this would only grow just about two, three feet, two, three feet, nice little tight ball. It turns brilliant purple in the winter. So it's green, green, green. Wintertime, it's like a dark burgundy purple color. And that would be a really nice little shrub to use, or a lot of times I've used them in pots even, kind of for a little filler in the winter time to add some interest um, in a little container. Ah, uh, the sarcococca, the one with too many C's and O's and A's in it. So probably everybody's got sarcococca. Maybe you didn't know that it was called sarcococca. We call it all kinds of different names up here, sweet box and, and other stuff. This is a great staple evergreen shrub for shade gardens. This is the must have, I think for anybody in our climate, whether we're going low, we're going tall, we're going medium. We've got a few different species to choose from. The humulus, you know, I've had 25 years in my yard and I'm looking at something that tall. You know, this spreads into a nice little evergreen low plant, blooms profusely February, March, April, and smells incredible. You won't even see the flowers, but the whole yard will smell kind of like sweet vanilla. Yeah, it's a really good fragrance on those. The russifolia, would be if I'm looking for a big tall shrub, maybe something five or six feet tall as a specimen in my shade garden. And then I didn't put it on here, but we would have uh, Confusa would be the middle stage one. So I want something maybe three or four feet tall. So you've got some options uh, for size, but for shade, dry shade especially, that's a great dry shade shrub for underneath trees and things that blooms in the winter. Uh, Sarka Coke is a must have. We got lots of those around right now. Kind of the same with these, same kind of location, uh, part shade on these to part sun is better, not deep dark shade. But we have plants like the Cotaway. I've got one right here. You can see it's already turned red for the winter. So that's not going to lose its leaves. It's evergreen. Coast Lucotaway like that is actually a native, you know, that we would find out in the, in the Pacific Coast Mountains around here and up and down from BC to Northern California. But that loves dry, it's manageable in size, it blooms in spring, it's got a nice little flower. But it's a great foliage plant, I think, for people trying to look a little maybe native in their yard, but still have some interest. That's a variety called uh, Scarletta, you'll see on the slide there. It's always going to turn that reliable, bright fire engine red, a purple color for the winter months. And then we go back to green in spring with just red on the new growth that way, okay? Then we get into Mahonia. So this is what I use a lot of in my own yard to keep the Hummers happy in the winter. We can find different Oregon grapes or hybrids of Oregon grape that will start blooming here now. And if I've got a few different cultivars or types, I can get nectar in those yellow flowers all the way into March if I choose the right ones. So the first one to bloom is always soft crest. They're just budding out right now. Um, that's a fun little plan. If you know Oregon grape, this is the only one I've seen that has no pokey on it at all, right? Just nice and soft, it's just got different foliage. You know, that's not a native, I wanna make sure that's clear. That's a, a cross, 
of an Asian species of Mahonia with a North American one to get a kind of a hybrid. So that's a fun one for pots or in the garden either way. I will tell you from experience, I'm working on a huge uh, a rabbit presentation for 2024. Who's fighting rabbits? You know, silly rabbits, those plants are for me. That's the name of the talk we're doing. So I'll be doing it at the Master Gardener Conference, but we'll do it here as well. Um, rabbits are killing my yard, I'll tell you right now. They are all over the place every day I get home, every day I wake up. They're out there eating my grass or a plant. They will eat. If you put go home today and you put this in your yard and plant it and love it, you'll wake up tomorrow morning and it will be gone if you have rabbits in your yard. So pots or put some repellent around it because I have tried this 10, 12 times in the last five, six years and they are gone in one day. I don't know what it is. In fact, I laugh, they finally put it on the tag. Watch out for bunnies. They will love these as much as you do. It's even on the back there. So at least they're honest because that is not rabbit resistant. How's that? Um, so keep an eye on that one. If we go to the second phase of Mahonia's here, um, Dark Star is one that just turns a little more purple in the winter time. That's native Mahonia. If we go Mahonia, Aquafolium, Oregon Grape, we can do bushy, we can do low, we can do creeping. There's all kinds of species. Those are always going to be in bloom here, being a native in March. You know, I'm going to get towards that end of winter, early spring, and I'm going to have the yellow nectar flowers I want. In between are going to be these big bushy hybrid Mahonias like Charity, Arthur Menzies, Winter Sun. We get quite a few different ones of these in. That's going to make a specimen plant. You know, if I put one of those in, ours down at the Arboretum is probably eight feet by eight feet now after 20 years. It's a beautiful specimen shrub. When that thing blooms, it is an absolute hummingbird haven. They are all over there the entire winter. That's going to be a kind of December, January, February time frame, kind of right in the cold of winter. Doesn't make any sense, but that's when it blooms and it always loves that time of year. So look at your options. A for the hummingbirds, great flower power, uh, two over the winter. But all three of those, I think again, even though two of those aren't native here, they all have that kind of native -y feel to me, or, or nativar feel, where you can mix them in with a lot of our native stuff. Uh, we'll have some more polygala uh, coming out of winter. Um, if you've ever tried that, that, you can see by the flower, that's in the pea family. That's not a plant you'll probably see around a lot of places. I brought, started bringing in here most of our staff bought them the first couple years and now they all beg for more and we should have them for our customers so we tend to get some of these in. It's not an easy plant to find, there's not like 50 every year but probably 20 total for us. Um, but that's going to bloom and smell incredible at the tail end of winter again and th this particular one uh, called Kaminsky repeat flowers in the summer so I've got really nice flower power for multiple seasons. That would look like a little flat shrubby mat. It's not crazy invasive. It's not a ground cover really, but it doesn't get very tall. It's just going to grow like a little mat. And I'd see the flowers coming on that during, during, the, during the winter especially. Um, next one there, and I brought, I didn't bring a variegated one in. I brought a little one in. It's up here somewhere. But there's, there it is. You can see the flower buds. You know, there's always something kind of simple about Pieris. Everybody's probably got Pieris in their yard. The Japanese Andromeda. You know, variegated ones add the foliage interest again. But even any Pieris, this time of year, you, hopefully you're not out pruning it in the summer, fall, because then I have the flower buds, and there's something about my Pieris I love, and we'll come home every day, and it's like, ooh, spring's coming, spring's coming. The flower buds sitting there waiting to open in March again. March usually pretty early. Um, so lots of different options on Pieris, variegated ones, dwarf ones, tall ones old school ones that get big which some people probably have in their yard as well um, but cool foliage color in the spring but that winter bud you know the flower bud sitting there all winter i think again adds some add some fun interest we've still got all of our heathers on special it's 75th anniversary for sunnyside this year uh, for our customer appreciation sale a couple weeks ago we had uh, heathers going for 750 which is pretty cheap for heathers these days um, we still have some out there. I just kept them going on sale. So if you want any Firefly, I've had one up here somewhere. You probably see it better than me. A little Scotch Heather is going to bloom in the summer, but I'm going to turn orange, red, different colors on the foliage in the winter is really fun. Or we do Heath, like these. This is Kramer's Road. 
thousand flower buds on that little plant right now and that will start blooming here in November, December, January, February, into March in the dead of winter again. I've actually got reliable flower, uh, hardy flower power on those ericas. So still light, light pink, dark pink, white, some colunas. There's still some great ones out there if you want to take advantage of the special here too. Now some fall color stuff. So oak leaf hydrangea, I brought one in here and you can see turning for the fall. You know, that's an old wood blooming hydrangea, big white panicle flowers. They turn pink as we get into fall, the flowers. They'll turn brown eventually and we kind of deadhead them for the winter, but we get to enjoy the fall color here. And typically up here, oak leaf doesn't really go dormant. So you're probably gonna walk out there all winter long and see those leaves looking just like that. You know, maybe we get a super cold winter, they will drop their foliage and then come right back out come springtime again. But oak leaf hydrangea, superior fall color. If you get an old one, you can almost see on that plant. I picked that one so you can see it. Can you see the peely bark coming out? So I get an old plant, I'm gonna have almost like paper bark maple trunk, which is kind of fun in the winter too. Um, and then a great summer bloomer. You know, that's a, that to me is a, a shrub for all seasons. How's that? So pick that one. I didn't bring PG hydrangeas in, but again, mine still looks great. Full bloom right now. Yeah, it's got some brown flowers here and there that all deadhead, but I still got color coming on until we get a hard frost. So nice fall color on the leaves, but also great summer fall bloom all the way until we get kind of cold, cold. We've got some berry things like everybody kind of probably sees our native snowberries around, right? You get snowberries, little white ones in the woods. So this is a, a cultivars off of those um, that we would have that same look but much heavier berry production and probably a nicer looking plant I think for the modern landscape so candy would always be pink galaxy is going to be white and we could I think we still have some of those out there they come up and they're just covered in berries here late summer fall it's a great pollinator plant you know for like July and August when they bloom the bees are going crazy on those here uh, but that would give me a really nice berry set here to enjoy October, November before we get into winter. We have things like Aronia. Now I took that picture in spring when it was blooming so that would get a nice little spring white flower. This time of year we're turning brilliant orange, brilliant red, brilliant yellow and we have those dark black little choke cherries on there for the birds. So if we had Aronia in our yard um, either the old school ones would be a big plant, you know, like a 10, 12 foot shrub, small tree. This dwarf stuff is going to be more manageable with the great fall color and then again the nice uh, berries for the birds in the fall. Uh, sumac is always towards the top of the fall color list. If you've had sumac in your yard, yes, it kind of likes to creep and maybe not take over. It's probably too strong of a word, but you'll have a lot of sumac if you plant sumac. If you've got room, it's a fabulous you know, kind of suckering, spreading shrub, great texture, um, great fall color, and kind of looks like deer antlers in the winter. They call it staghorns. I got those fuzzy little antlers with the seed heads on them all winter, which is kind of fun. Um, tiger eyes is always one I bring up in particular because that's not fall. That would be like June, July, August. Those always have a limey, golden, <coughs> a great color to the foliage. And then the fall, we go ahead and turn to our orange and red and purple and the brighter colors. So that would be maybe one to choose if you like a little year-round foliage color um, in addition to the, the fall color coming. Uh, filberts, uh, we'll still eventually get the dark ones again here. This has been a plant that's been missing in action for about four years for us. I know there's some coming down the pipeline finally here locally. We'll have them again. But if you've had contorted filbert, that's going to be the little twisted contorted large shrub. You've probably seen those around. Um, that's a fun plant uh, for the winter interest. It blooms in February. We have the little catkins come down on it. Um, that picture there is about mid-February. You can see the dark purple foliage coming out and that would get a pink catkin. That's a filbert right there on the front on the, with the green leaves not turning yellow yet to drop its leaves. But when that's dormant, I would see all the funky twisted fun branches in the winter and then again that would bloom in February with the little catkin flowers as well. Um, love viburnums. Viburnums one of the best group of shrubs I think if you need large shrub. Uh, deciduous viburnums 
from everything like snowball bush right here. We get everybody in the count knows big white flowers, gray fall color. We have double flowers out there. The pink dawn is the one that's really about fall and winter. This one right now would be bright red burgundy, the leaves, and it would be starting to bloom. This is one that starts in October, November, and blooms off and on through the winter months when the plant is bare all the way into March. So that would be our pink flower and super fragrant as well. That's another one we can get excellent fragrance on. That's not a little pruned shrub. I wanna make sure we're clear on that. If I'm putting a pink dawn in, I'm looking for a eight, 10, 10 foot specimen plant. I'm using at the back of the garden as a small tree even, where I'm gonna see the shape and get to enjoy the flowers. If I'm trying to prune that thing into a three foot ball, probably gonna look quite right and you're probably not gonna get as much flower on it as well, okay? I'm hoping we'll have some paper bush again this year. Last year was a strikeout for us. That's another hard plant to find these days. But that's a plant for shade only. That's deep dark shade, a present from China. That's the original paper plant that they would have written scrolls on. But that would lose its leaves, turn yellow, and then the dead of winter in February, fragrant white. Uh, that's a yellow one. You can also find orange, which is really hard to find. Um, you can find orange ones of those too. So I would have a eight foot specimen shrub with those big clusters of those fragrant flowers on it in the dead of winter with nothing else on. So if you got deep shade, you got room for a specimen, look for one of those. That's a pretty sweet plant. I hope we have some of these in right after the holidays is usually when I can hopefully scrape a few together, but that's a hard plant to get uh, these days for most of the nurseries. The winter hazel, not witch hazel, this is a little different. Winter hazel is one that would be great fall color again, but this is one that would be yellow, lightly fragrant. We have a big one out in our garden in front of the store here. Um, these would be blooming in like late February, March time frame, so right towards the end of winter. That's one of those first things to kind of pop to life as we get out of the holiday time. Uh, Father Gilla, I absolutely love. There's, I only have a few left. There's one underneath the TV there. You can see the orange, the red, all the different colors going. You know, I'm surprised more gardeners don't utilize Father Gilla, to be honest with you. I think that's a great shrub that looks native. Some people call it witch alder, but spectacular fall color, really easy to grow. And that would bloom again, little white bottle brush flowers that are great smell in May. So that's another one to me is a plant for all seasons, really easy to grow. And the fall color, top five to me, that's one you're gonna get every color in the rainbow and always a good, reliable, bright uh, foliage this time of year. Uh, I put a Hypericum on there. I think we still have a few of these left. Um, this is not St. Everyone know Hypericum. They probably think St. John's wort, right? That little ground cover that takes over everything. This is in the same family, but a little bit different. These they call floral berries. So if I went down to buy my, my sweet wife a flower bouquet here in the fall at any shop, it would probably have a cut stem of floral berry in it somewhere. Red, purple, black, white, pink, red, any color in the rainbow, you can find them. But it's just a really easy little shrub to grow up for gardeners, especially if you like cutting a little bit to bring them in the fall. So these would bloom that nice yellow flower again, July, August, or favor the birds. But then I get into the, the winter time here in September, October, November, I'm looking at a plant that drops its leaves with those bright orange or bright red, or I can again pick pretty much any color. I'm gonna have those berries on there for a little bit of interest this time of year. Uh, beauty berry, husky berry. I think I brought one of these in. Yeah, there's one up top here. Um, those will turn color here um, as we get into fall, but you're always going to have that metallic purple berry on them. That's not a native thing. It's not really for the birds, to be honest with you. Um, but it is an interesting shrub uh, that would add some fall interest. If you like different colors, that's another big deciduous plant uh, that would give us purple, which is not a very common uh, berry color up here. Um, and a pretty easy, pretty easy thing to grow. And that again, part shade, a uh, part sun location. Uh, nine bark, that's mine when we had heavy snow a few winters ago on my old one. But nine bark is, would be a native type shrub. Really nice foliage color, nice bloom, all the above during the season. But in the winter time, I do got some pretty cool bark on those. That'll kind of look like a birch a little bit, but on a shrub. 
So yes, we can get nine barks that get six, eight feet tall, or we can get some that only grow four or five feet tall. But in, when everything's gone, the fall color, we've enjoyed all that. I'm gonna look at some pretty sweet twigs in the winter time. It's not just another plant. It's got some fun, fun little twig, uh, twig peely in the winter time. Twig dogwoods. <clears throat> you know, I use a lot of these in my own landscape for this reason alone for winter. You know, they look nice during the season too. Um, especially if you've got bad drainage, wet soil. Twig dogwood's a great native that we can use in a lot of our garden situations. But I could pick yellow twig, red twig, orange twig. I could pick variegated leaf, gold leaf, green leaf. You've got a lot of choices on twig dogwoods these days. Um, I keep some on my bank, you know, for the birds, for shelter. They get berries for the birds, shelter for the birds. Nice color in the winter to drive home and see a big mass of yellow, orange, red twigs kind of all mixed together. I have other ones in my yard that look like nice shrubs, like everything else. They get pruned. Um, so this is one I know for me, I like using them in my Christmas wreath. So I try to cut mine back so I get the brightest red wood that I can go harvest that next fall that I can use over the holidays you know again in arrangements or just enjoy the bright color in the yard either way uh, there's my witch hazel a few winters ago inside the fence so witch hazel is a tree uh, one that I would always get to me top five fall color you see well, there's some witch hazel back there we have out for sale that'll knock your socks off with the foliage color right now so that drops its leaves goes dormant then I wait till right after Christmas and I walk out in my yard mid late January February into March and I have full bloom doesn't matter how cold it gets doesn't matter anything I'm gonna always have really good flower power in the winter on that witch hazel the yellow ones uh, like Arnold promise is much tidier if you're looking for a small tree you know mine's been in 20 years it's probably 12 feet by 12 feet or so total not huge for a tree really um, very manageable for a small garden um, the yellow ones will smell, so I'll not only have the bright color, but I'll also have excellent fragrance. I could also choose, we have Helena out there, would give me orange if I want orange spider flowers, or we have Diane that would give me red. Those two aren't going to smell as much, but we would have the bright color as well. So you can kind of pick your color, red, orange, yellow, all going to get great fall color, but keep in mind, the Diana and the Helene are probably going to get a little bit larger as they get older. The Arnold Promise would be a little tidier. Same with Cornus Moss. So that's a, a, a early blooming dogwood. We have those out there right now. Great fall color. Beautiful little cherry-like fruit on them. Um, and that one would be in full bloom again late February, March. So I would look out and see a cloud of yellow flowers on a really early blooming tree. Japanese maples, you know, coral barks, bihu gives me like a yellowy to orange color. There's a lot of cool Japanese maples getting hybridized right now that don't grow as big and they're going to give me some twig color. So keep those in mind for the landscape or again, a lot of me being a maple addict, I just buy another pot and I can grow another one in a container too and then my wife doesn't get mad either. Right? Mm -hmm. Birch, we mentioned white bark birches on there, stewardia. You know, beautiful peeling bark on Stewardia tree. That's another tree for all seasons. Summer bloom, excellent fall color. And then the winter time, I've got that beautiful bark uh, color going on those as a, as a specimen. Paper bark maple, I brought one up. There's a paper bark right in the front over there. You can see the color starting to turn for fall, but I would have the brown cinnamon color peeling bark on those all winter. That's a beautiful tree and a pretty small a maple for a modern landscape too. Pacific fire, you know, that's a great example. We were talking about vine maples. I'm not going to find a Pacific fire vine maple up off of Highway 2 because that's not native, but that is strictly native vine maple <coughs> that has been selected out for the twig color. So that looks like vine maple, acts like vine maple, grows like vine maple, but I have coral colored wood like I would on a Japanese maple. So I'm surprised more gardeners don't take advantage of those too because that would be a native type tree that I would get some great winter interest off uh, with the branch colors. Now if we get into kind of the last few here, some flower things, like I mentioned before, pansies, violas. If I'm looking for flower power in my pots, in my borders, I've got window boxes, all of its pansies now heading into winter. I'm not going to have a geranium 
where Zinni is or Million Bells last much longer. We're, we're going to go to the compost bin here pretty quick before winter. Pansies are the flowers that I can enjoy all through the winter. They can freeze solid, thaw out, here we go to bloom again. So get your pansies. This is one I'll speak for me. I usually wait too long. I'll get to it next month, next week, whatever. I still like my annuals. Then I go looking for my pansies, and they're all sold out for the winter, and so I'm stuck with no flowers all winter. So don't wait too long. I asked her today because I knew this class was happening, and I still need some more. Are the pansies out? She said, no. There's another big truck coming next week, and that might be it for the year. I think most of our growers are pretty much sold out of pansies now. We do have a big shipment again coming in. It blows my mind, but this little place sells like 9,000 pansies in the fall. Put your wrap your head around that. That's a lot of pansies out there. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, bulbs. There's a good example of crocus. That orange monarch is one of my favorites. You don't see that color around a lot, but typical crocus, lavenders, whites, you know, pastel colors, purples, things like that. It makes a great naturalizing bulb, super short that I can throw out anywhere. I have crocus all over my yard. You wouldn't even know they're there until we get to February. Now you see carpets of flowers everywhere underneath the trees and the lace leaf maples and all the rest of it. So great bulb to get. I love aconites. We're sold out because I talk these up every year. It's my, my fault. Uh, but look for aconites early. That is a great bulb. I have, I probably have purchased a thousand aconites in my life now and they are all over every area of my garden. They love shade. Everybody's got shade. And this is one that I'll look out right after Christmas and see a carpet of yellow. Those will be in full bloom in January, February. So that's another really early one and a great one to naturalize. Don't be alarmed if you buy some. They look like little shriveled up dead raisins. Like you go, what? That is not gonna grow and they always do. So that's a really easy one. Same with early daffodils. You know, I just planted, I don't know why, I bought four more bags of Teddy Tates again. I don't know how many I have, but it's too many now. But I was like, yeah, I put some more of those in somewhere. But these are always, again, I look for bulbs, especially winter bloomers, that naturalize. I can put a bag in the ground or three bags in the ground and have them forever. They get better and better every year. Instead of sometimes those bulbs, we got to just buy a new bag, buy a new bag, and we kind of recycle them that way. Uh, but these early short daffodils like tetitates will offer some fragrance easy bloomers pots the ground you can always find a place to me for some nice easy low daffodils or narcissus snowdrops and snowflakes i added some more of these at my place last winter because again i wanted my wife to look out the kitchen window and go "Ooh, look at all the flowers that are blooming here in, in january so snowdrop snowflakes both great options the first things to bloom white sometimes again a little nice fragrance on a warm day when the sun's out that time of year but i'm going to have that early flower power i'm looking for a few perennials so crimson fans mukdinia has anyone got mukdini in their yard yet so that almost looks like a japanese maple the, fo the foliage looks very maple-ish that's a little shade garden perennial that just sits there green and does bloom a little bit in the summer but it's all about fall. You see Mugdinia out there, you're gonna go, wow, that is crimson. So it turns beautiful color before it goes dormant. You go to the dirt, it turns to mush. Then we see you again next spring when it leaves out. Anemones are always strong fall bloomers. Um, those are one of those gifts that keeps on giving. You plant a couple anemones, you let them go to seed, you'll have a nice uh, patch of anemones down the road, right? Those naturalize pretty easily. Uh, wildflowers. You know, this is one you probably won't find very much right now, but if I was in here like February-ish next year, early March, that's one of the first perennials that we bring in. These will start blooming that early. They're often fragrant. And as long as we don't get super cold after they start growing, those will go off and on through the entire season. We have to make sure the one thing with wallflower is good drainage. We do not want clay or heavy soil with wallflowers. We'll be talking a lot about this in our class in a couple weeks, the Evergreen Perennial class I'll teach here. Um, but just to give you a little taste, hookera, I have hookeraitis, that's the disease I've termed myself. Um, I couldn't tell you how many hookeras I have in my yard, but it is way too many, and my wife would say the same thing. Quit bringing home more hookeras. Um, I love the color, I love the easiness, they go in pots, they go in the yard, they go anywhere. So I 
Sorry, honey, we'll not bring, stop bringing home hookahs because there's always a fun new one every year. But look at your options. I mean, shades, sun, I could put a rainbow of color from dark black purple all the way to bright yellow, even white and green. And there's a hookah in there. Yellows, orange, red, purple, variegated, anything. There's a pretty fun hookah uh, to try. Same with hellebores. You know, that is the winter jewel, the winter bloomer of all perennials. Uh, we've got a pretty good chunk of those in right now, and there's still more coming. We probably stock 40, 50 different hellebores, I think, when it's all said and done. Uh, we start in November on some, and we're going to go all the way into April with different hellebores. This is a really easy plant, dry shade, evergreen foliage, really easy bloom. Uh, we'll talk a lot about hellebores in the class, but one trick for the, that I would give you if you have hellebores, cut all the foliage off at the holidays. I do that every year. You've eliminated your bugs, you've eliminated any possible disease. You, you can see the flowers. If you have old hellebores, bite the bullet and get all those old leaves cut off of there. I walk out when I'm home between Christmas and New Year's and cut all my hellebores back every season without exception. Then you go, what have I done? I just cut all my leaves off. Now I get to see the flowers come out. I got brand new healthy leaves and off we go for another season. The one complaint I hear from customers on hellebores is bug aphids in the winter time. And I know if I was an aphid, I'd like to hang out on your hellebore too because I got big thick green leaves, I got shelter and I got a lot of sugar. So either spray them, watch them, they're always on the bottom, or just cut the leaves off once a year. I've never had to spray my hellebores in my whole garden's life because I get rid of the bugs, throw them in the yard waste, fresh foliage out the next month. I got a brand new plant for the season, okay? <coughs> the other thing I would say on the hellebores is if you look at that picture like that penny's pink you can see the foliage how it's modeled you know that's modern hellebore to me you know back when I paid fifty dollars for a four inch hellebore from Mr. Hinckley at the garden show probably 35 years ago it's like whoa what's that we never even seen that kind of stuff here yet now of course you can buy a big one for a fraction of that um, it was still, I still have it in my yard. I'm never getting rid of it for $50 I paid for it. <laughs> but that's the difference between now, then and now to me is A, my flowers are going to stand up and not nod down because that one definitely hangs down. It still looks good, but it's hanging towards the ground. And foliage is the other thing. I mean, there's so many cool, I think I brought a variegated one, right? No, oh, that's cyclamen. I got a variegated one up here somewhere. I'll, we'll find it after class but variegated leaves or mottled foliage. So when it's not in bloom, it's still a really cool looking plant during spring, summer, fall, and then I get to enjoy the flowers again over the winter. Epimediums, you know, there's a bulletproof plant. Who's got epimediums, anybody? You know, I use those in the corners I never want to water and I don't really want to weed or do anything with. So it's like, I'm never gonna get to that corner in the shade with any kind of hose. We'll put epimedium back there because it'll be happy as can be. So these will naturalize, dry shade, under trees. This is literally, both these would be in the winter. So this is color in the winter. They don't go dormant, they turn red. It would sit there with that foliage color all winter. And then we get to February, here comes my flower stalks up through the foliage and on we go for another season. So lots of options, pinks, orange, you know, whites, yellows. There's a lot of different cultivars of epimedium out there these days. And you can kind of play with your foliage a little bit too, because I, I think that's a really cool plant. Same with euphorbias. Now I let mine bloom and I deadhead them so they don't seed everywhere. Who's got euphorbias growing all over their yard? Yeah, there you go. Deadhead them, then you don't have the seeds drop. Because um, that's a really cool plant. Spurge is super drought tolerant, evergreen, really hardy, great in pots, great in the yard, really anywhere. Um, but that's the one drawback is we get those beautiful flower clusters we let them dry go to seed I'm gonna have little euphorbias popping up all over my yard down the road or the neighbors probably too um, so just dead at them let them bloom for a few months get into like mid spring just go out there and cut the flower stalks off and enjoy the foliage and the plant until you get to bloom again the next year lots of grasses you know evergreen grass uh, will add year-round interest especially in the winter I brought a couple up here like the orange sedge um, that will keep its color so a lot of these, again, I use in pots. I'll be buying more orange sedge from my front containers here probably today and take them home. 
because I like the grass in the winter with the pansies and some fun foliage stuff. Or I can use them in the ground. I have that emerald lime. That's a picture from my yard. You wouldn't even know I had those in the summer. They're buried underneath a bunch of maples and shrubs and they're just totally hidden. But when all the perennials have gone dormant, the shrubs have lost their leaves and now you look out in the yard, you're like, whoa, what's all those gold clumps you got going over in the yard there? Again, add some nice color. And grass is always a little bit of sound and motion as well to me. So easy, easy on evergreen grass or, whoop. More deciduous ones. You know, right now we are in full color. I brought one up here. Yeah, it's got the plumes on the bottom there on the front side. So right now we're getting into plume season, I call it. Not really bloom, but you get your plumes. So all the grasses look fabulous here in the fall, getting all the colors into them. They're in full plume. You know, those may go dormant. I zip them off after they're done, you know, with the holidays and see you again next year or enjoy the frost all winter. It's going to stand there offer a little bit of motion some sound again but certainly I think a great plant for the for the winter time we have stuff like wintergreen <coughs> so I brought a variegated one up right here now look at the cool leaves on that now that's fabulous plant so that's blooming in summer and I'm gonna get those big red little cherry uh, fruits on there to enjoy all through the all through the fall the winter season into spring so that's where we get our wintergreen gum from that's one thing but the variegated things or just green um, is a great little addition to the garden as a little ground cover in part shade or a fabulous plant to add to your containers. I'll have those in my pots here this winter as well as kind of a little spiller to hang over one of the edges. Now this is one plant I would buy today if you're going to, if you like cyclamen. I brought one up because we just got them. Does anyone do hardy cyclamen? Yeah. So this is a plant it's like the opposite of anything that would go dormant all summer long you would never you go my cyclamen's dead i don't see it it's gone it's it just disappears in the heat of the summer fall it comes up they're just going to start blooming and i will have that sweet foliage and flower going off and on all through the cold part of the year here through until spring again so coom we can get all kinds of different foliages up there. You'll see a really nice mixture on the table. We just got about 150 of them in, but that's it for the whole year because that's a hard plant uh, for us to get. Um, but if I had a woodlandy garden, shade, something I want fun to kind of tuck in with my perennials and things, uh, hardy cyclamen is a fabulous little, little plant to grow. Um, and this, again, get them today or soon because I think we sell out every year at some point over the winter and I just won't be able to get them again until the next October kind of thing. So that's, that's a tougher one to find. So that's a lot of plants. I think we made it, look at that, exactly one hour. Um, <clears throat> that's a lot of plants. Now there's a lot of cool stuff out there to look at. I don't, I, didn't, I wouldn't bring the whole thing in here, wouldn't have anywhere to sit, right? I would have plants all through. Um, it's certainly if there's a couple things you want to ask about, we can do some questions um, and shopping after class. If you want to go out and do some shopping today in the sunshine, get home and do some planting. Um, this is an easy one for us. We just put all the plants on 20% off. So if you want to go get shrubs, perennials, grasses, conifers, whatever in, I mean, I guess anything could look cool in the winter. So you will be able to convince my cashier to give you 20% off if it's a plant. How that? So just tell me about the class. They hit a little button on there. Um, and you get 20% off all your plants. Um, that'll go through Friday this week. So if you don't want to do it today, you come down tomorrow, come down during the week, either way. Um, the compost is also on special all month for October. I love selling people compost, especially in the fall for mulching and planting time. Um, it's buy three, get one free, the bags or the bales. So that's a great little special here for all of October. So take a girl like me and you got 10 bales behind the house at all times. It's a good time to purchase the compost as well. Um, I'm just going to point out just a couple things that weren't my slideshow. Now, does anybody have crepe myrtle? You see that plant right there turning orange and red? Mm -hmm. Does anyone have crepe myrtle? So, if you would have asked me 10 years ago, let's say, what are you talking to me about crepe myrtle for? We're never selling that in Washington. Yeah. You know, call it global warming, call it whatever you want, but we have a climate for crepe myrtle these days. I don't think I ever saw one bloom for 20 years, and I saw them growing great. They're obviously a spectacular fall color. That doesn't matter no matter what the year is. But I was like, I don't want to sell crepe myrtle because they just never bloom up here. If I go to Portland, that extra five, 10 degrees warmer, streets lined with them. 
So that's a plant that blooms in like July, August, September. They got a great flower on them um, in all sorts of different colors and growth habits. But I just was like, I don't want to sell anybody crepe myrtle. This is three years in a row. I've seen everybody's bloom that has them. Uh, we're going to get even more next year. I think that's a really useful shrub or small tree. Um, you might look at some crepe myrtles because that would be heat of the summer flower, great for the bees, um, but really good fall color. And I wish we had an older one to show you because those get some pretty sweet bark on them too. That's going to give me some really cool peely different colored bark as we get an old crepe myrtle on there as well. So maybe look at some of those. There's great dwarf ones would be the other thing now too. I don't have to have a 12, 15 foot plant down the road. I could have something maybe four or five feet is all and still have that same thing I'm looking for. So we still have nice crepe myrtles. Let me see if there's anything else in here that we didn't really talk about. I'm not gonna start on maples because we'll be here for another hour, but you can enjoy that maple. Um, that's probably it. We might have one about cousin it here. Look at that, isn't that fun? So that's cousin it. We call that this Frankie boy. That's got a kind of a, a thread leafed oriental arborvitae. So there's another one. Instead of your green soldiers in a row, no one would ever think arborvitae if they saw that. That's a fun little plant too to throw in. How tall does that get? You know, you could prune that if you wanted, but I don't think that's ever going to get bigger than me. You know, probably about four footish. Yeah, about the size on, on Frankie boy. Uh, but you'll see a few other treasures up here. You know, we still. You know, I'll just say, Sunnyside doesn't close for the winter. It amazes me. I think I've been running this place now 13 years and people still think we were only open half the year and we close for the winter. Mm -hmm. We're doing Christmas trees. We got Christmas wreath making coming on right here all through December, uh, you know, November and December. Uh, we always have good plants around. You know, we might pack it into hopefully the dry areas that we have so you don't have to get rained on while you're shopping in December. Um, but we will always have a bunch of cool plants around here for winter interest as well. So, so stop in. That's always the easy answer. Well, I, I want my yard to look good all year. Well, sweet. Just come down to Sunnyside like once a month, all year long. You'll find something to bloom, add it to the yard, and then you got it going. So, because we don't force anything, you know, we we might look like we're putting it in a greenhouse. We don't heat these things. So yes, we heat this for reeds so people don't freeze in here. But the rest of the cold storage just sits in a hoop house. It's not like I have. The heat crank to 75 to keep it alive all winter um you know we let things go dormant naturally and keep it the way they should be so so there you go so we got any questions you got fall mm -hmm. color overload mm -hmm. yeah now crepe myrtle is usually a tree yep is that a bush form shrub i i'll tell you and again i'm not i can do it that way if you want but i would always buy in our business we call it we say multi-stem so yeah. I could buy crepe myrtle as a, you know, trained up like a lollipop and turn it into some sort of tree if I want. Naturally, I would always have a multi-stem plant. So I like that form better, which is what we're probably yeah. going to stick with here. And it's, it's like witch hazel. A lot of the plants we talked about today, vine maples, another great example, where I would have a short trunk and a nice little crotch on it with that multi-stem branching, I think it's going to be a nicer plant in the landscape. So that is one... That's either Pecos or Zuni, but if I plant that in my yard, I might get seven, eight feet tall when it gets full grown. It'll be a long time, but it's not going to get super big. Yeah. Got any more? No one even. I didn't. I didn't even bring up the crab apples. Look at all my little Christmas lights on there. So I'll say this with crab apple because I've. That's all probably one of my favorite flowery trees of all. Um, you know, if we had this talk 20 years ago, I probably didn't have any crab apples around here because they were all garbage, to be fr frankly honest. Brutal disease, terrible scab, mildew. In our climate, crab apples were really tough. Um, we carry a lot of cool crab apples now, and I'll absolutely tell you with 100% certainty, they are disease immune. I mean, I select certain varieties that I don't ever, you would never have to spray that stuff. So this is golden raindrops right here. Really cool shaped foliage, but I would have those little quarter inch golden crab apples for the birds, you know, all through the fall, early winter. We get royal raindrops, red foliage with red little quarter inch crab apples for the birds on there all winter. There's some really good crabs. We got our, our spring tree shipment in about a week ago because otherwise I won't be able to get much in spring. So I have most of the really cool crab apples back there are available now if you want to get a head start on springtime. But I would say no disease. And the other thing with crab apple, you'll see that blue tag hanging on it. It would be meaningless to you, but it says right root. 
It's like, what the heck does that mean? So I get these crab apples grafted onto a specific rootstock so I will never have a sucker because those were my two issues with crab apples was disease, I didn't want to spray, and two, I wanted my tree. I don't need little seedlings popping up all over the root system. So that's the difference in modern crab apples now is a superior foliage, easy flower, lots of fruit for the birds, um, and no suckering, which is to, kind of the icing on the cake after all the rest of it. So look for that tag. Not all of them will be on right root, but the vast majority of the really cool ones we get back there, you're gonna pay a little bit more, you know, like we do with everything in life, but if you want the creme to the cram and no maintenance down the road, I would rather pay for the tree and not have to go out and cut suckers off every year for 30 years and just walk away and make it easy. All right? You got anything else? Well, go enjoy the sunshine out there.